I'll spend, short, I'll I'll spend, like I'll spend a minute just while here. Alors, bienvenue, uh, welcome, mon nom est Erwin Cutler, je suis député de Montréal, a member of parliament for Mount Royal, and I'm accompanied here today by my uh, fellow uh, parliamentarians, uh, co-chair James uh, Bazan from the uh, Conservative Party, Elizabeth May, leader of the Green Party, and our second guest has just appropriately, dutifully Sorry, arrived. No, no, no problem. I know what, we know what security is like. So I was going to waste a little more time just to make sure <laughs> we could accommodate. Uh, delighted to welcome you to the closing uh, day of Iran Accountability Week, which was launched by an all-party uh, group of parliamentarians a week ago uh, today to effectively sound the alarm on the massive domestic repression in Iran. And it has included uh, witness uh, testimony before our foreign affairs Subcommittee on International Human Rights, and our guest today will be testifying before that committee at 1 p.m. Uh, public forum with former Iranian uh, political prisoners, a take note debate where, again, parliamentarians from all parties this past Tuesday evening engaged in a four hour discussion of the Iranian fourfold threat, nuclear terrorist incitement, and in particular, and that was the focus on uh, human rights violations in Iran and one of the centerpieces of Iran Accountability Week which has been our Iranian political prisoner global advocacy project where members of parliament have adopted, as it were, uh, an Iranian political prisoner and advocated on their behalf so that they know that we stand in solidarity with them, that they are not alone, and that we will not relent uh, in our advocacy until uh, their release is secured. This uh, Iran Accountability Week could not have taken place at a more uh, propitious time, because as the uh, P5 plus one nuclear negotiations with Iran proceed, they have effectively overshadowed, if not sanitized, this massive uh, domestic repression. We have seen a an execution binge that has been almost unprecedented in the last 12 years, even by uh, Iran's uh, cruel standards, a criminalization of uh, dissent, uh, the imprisonment of uh, political prisoners and just two days ago, we learned again of an important uh, human rights uh, advocate, uh, Naj Mohammadi, uh, the reformist uh, advocate who had been advocating on behalf of the abolition of capital punishment, uh, who was uh, arrested, and the continued prosecution and persecution of the Baha'i. I can go on, but fortunately, we have two uh, leading uh, experts with us uh, today. Uh, our first, uh, and I'll begin uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Shahid. Uh, he's the uh, UN Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in Iran, one of the world's leading authorities uh, on uh, the situation of human rights in Iran. Uh, his mandate was recently uh, renewed uh, to the acclaim of all uh, internationally. Uh, his regular reports inform us all, uh, wherever we are on the situation. Uh, he will uh, speak first, and then he will uh, be joined afterwards by Maziar Bahari, uh, himself a, uh, an Iranian-Canadian uh, journalist and uh, filmmaker, a former uh, political uh, prisoner uh, whose films have also, uh, you know, compellingly uh, brought the case and cause of human rights in Iran uh, to the international forefront. So we'll begin with Dr. Ahmed Shahid. Thank you, Thank you Professor Kartler. Um, members of the press, honorable MPs, and my fellow guest, Mazi Bahari, a very good morning to you. Um, speaking about Iran is not a pleasurable subject because I have so much bad news to deliver frequently. But nevertheless, I will speak today. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with, with you. As Iran and its colleagues in the international community continue to pursue what I believe to be good faith efforts to jointly address long-standing security and uh, other challenges, we must also continue to maintain, I believe, a very sharp focus on addressing the conditions that continue to challenge Iranian government's 
ability to achieve its human rights obligations. And these are very, very serious challenges uh, in, in, in that regard. Um, as you heard, I shall be, um, I'm happy and privileged to brief the subcommittee this afternoon on, um, on what's happening in Iran with regard to human rights. Um, my report to the UN came out in March this year, and I reported the time that these children remain very dire. Um, I remain more alarmed um, as time have, as as time have, have you well. As time as time has uh, progressed since that time, there's been more reason uh, to be to be concerned uh, about uh, Iran. Um, five years ago, the government of Iran pledged to implement over 126 recommendations that came out of the UN members membership at its UPR review. Six weeks ago, Iran was again reviewed by the same council, the same membership, and Iran again accepted a second round of recommendations um, from, the, from that body. Uh, we found that uh, what they agreed to do five years ago really wasn't done uh, to a great deal. And we hope that we now have a chance to um, work further with Iran to make sure that these recommendations are now implemented in the time to come. And I do believe that more can be done to ensure that we uh, hold Iran to its word on these recommendations. Iran continues to execute people to a higher, higher per capita ratio than anybody else in the world. Um, and as you heard from Professor Cutler uh, moments ago, uh, over the past six weeks, the past few months, there's been an unprecedented uh, spike uh, in the rate of executions. Over the past uh, um, few weeks, it's been about six a day on average. That's a very, very, very high figure. And uh, I am concerned not just by the very high number of executions, but also the range of offenses for which people are put to death. Uh, a large number are for drug offenses which don't qualify under international law for, for, capital, for capital crime, capital punish, punishment. As with other offenses such as corruption, uh, sexual offenses, and increasingly political offense as well. And a growing number of juveniles, juvenile executions is also a matter of serious concern uh, to, to me. And um, in addition to executions, Iran continues to harass opposition uh, uh, members, residents, uh, 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 as they have in the past. As you heard, even after President Rouhani promised to have, to, to release dissidents, some were in fact released, but we just heard that Nargis Mohammadi is again being detained, uh, uh, um, and I don't even know the pretext for which it's, be, it's been done. So there's concern to be raised uh, in that regard uh, as, as well. And of course, Iran maintains it doesn't persecute political dissidents, doesn't persecute journalists, doesn't persecute lawyers. It maintains that they are not detained for the work they do as professionals, but for, for other activities, often defined as national security crimes, under laws which are so vague and so, so uh, widely phrased that any act action including talking to me, could be seen as a national security crime or propaganda against uh, the state. So clearly, the Iran's legal system uh, is being manipulated uh, to the advantage of the authorities to, to undermine any scope for peaceful ex expression of views by, uh, by the public. Iran's press law, as you well know, have 17 impermissible uh, types of content, including insulting leaders and offending the supreme, supreme leader. So clearly, um, this has resulted in a very large number of journalists being in prison, about 40 at the present time, and this number has remained stable over a long time. Other people have changed uh, um, as time have passed. And I'm concerned by a set of new laws that are being uh, processed through the parliamentary process, including those that would further limit the space for NGOs, uh, for political parties, and also for uh, lawyers, uh, granting the government powers over all three types of uh, uh, bodies and uh, uh, activists or uh, uh, professionals. Um, I have always been concerned about Iran's treatment of ethnic minority groups and religious minority, minority groups. Um, the Baha'i fared the worst. Uh, their top leadership remained in, in, in prison. Under the legal framework, Baha'i are almost non-persons uh, in the country. And other, uh, other laws uh, allow authorities to identify people of different faiths and, uh, and deny them certain access to basic services. So we find discrimination against um, the Christian minorities, uh, the Sunni Muslims, in addition to the Baha'is and other minority religious uh, uh, communities there. Now in my, um, in my um, engagement with Iran 
now into my, in the fifth year now, I have always advocated uh, the hand of friendship towards Iran if they are willing to work with me, because obviously there is cooperation is an important element of encouraging governments to progress towards uh, better human rights, uh, 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 you know, c conduct. However, uh, Iran remains reluctant, or I should say, Iran refuses to, en to engage with me, if it's, a, if it's a proper word here, because uh, they are required by U UN's rules to give me access to the country, to visit the country, to enable me to meet people who have grievances, to meet officials who can explain the sources of this, this grievance and what, what, what the government is doing with them, and to visit prisons and see what conditions are. But they have denied me this opportunity for five years running, and I think that itself says a lot about what the intentions are. Having said that, I still remain committed uh, to the task of um, monitoring on, on, Iran, on Iran's human rights conduct and also supporting the government should they desire my, uh, seek my support in moving that direction. I shall uh, restrain myself here now and uh, um, let, let you hear from the very eloquent uh, uh, Mazi Bahari and others who may be speaking after me today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahid. Thank you, Mr. Cutler, and thanks all friends for being here, and thank you uh, for being here. I was arrested in June 2009. I was in prison for 118 days, 107 days in solitary confinement. I went through physical and psychological torture, but I'm not here to talk about my case now. I, before coming here, I consulted with some friends in Iran and outside of Iran who've been through similar ordeal as me, some of them uh, through war, even uh, worse uh, physical and psychological tortures that I suffered. And I would like to tell you a little bit about what many journalists, mostly unnamed, unknown journalists around Iran are going through on a regular basis. Unfortunately, many of them are not known outside of Iran. Many of them have very difficult names to pronounce. I'm really lucky that some people know how to pronounce my name. Thank you. Uh, and, but what I think uh, really, uh, maybe I'm not sure how can I, what word I can use, what really repulsed many of my friends in Iran was this statement by Foreign Minister Zarif in an interview with Charlie Rose last week saying that no one is jailed for his opinion uh, or for her opinion. He didn't say her, but yeah, what he meant that people are not jailed for their opinions in Iran, which is a lie. Uh, it is uh, technically a lie, and it is a lie that is repeated by different members of the uh, Iranian government. People say that uh, Dr. Zarif responded uh, to a question specifically by Jason Rezaian, our friend, a dual national who's been in uh, prison. So by dissecting uh, what Jason is going through, I would like to somehow maybe clarify what other journalists in Iran are going through now. It's been almost a year. He was arrested last June, in June 2014 and he's been in jail for almost a year now. We have not heard the Iranian government uh, officially announcing what are the charges for his arrest. We have heard rumors about it. We have heard different MPs talking about it. We have heard his lawyer talking to a news agency very close to the Revolutionary Guards, uh, talking about different charges against Jason that he is most probably going to be accused of economic espionage. I, as someone who went through the same thing, can testify that the charges will be most probably bogus. The charges will have to do with what is regarded as a normal job of a, of a journalist. They say that he was looking into companies that help Iran to circumvent uh, sanctions. That is something that investigative journalists do all around the world. There is not, no difference between a dual national who is doing it in Iran and the rest of the world. The other uh, thing that we have to know about Jason, and we, we have uh, certain information about that, is that he's been forced to confess to his crimes. And most probably he has been, he was forced to confess 
a, a taped com, uh, confession for uh, working with different agencies and calling the uh, Western media as part of the Western intelligence apparatus that uh, the Western uh, world is um, using all its effort to undermine the holy uh, Islamic Republic. Again, I went through the same thing. I was forced to confess against certain members uh, of the Iranian government. And when I uh, rejected to refuse against the, those people, those individuals, and just uh, talked about general uh, ideas, general uh, uh, conspiracies that they fed me, I was punished again after my confession, and I spent more time uh, in prison after my confession. And I'm not sure exactly what uh, Jason is going has confessed to, but uh, hopefully uh, we will never see it. Because from my experience, I can tell you that going through confession is like being raped. But the difference between uh, confession and being raped is that it is a rape that is televised and then I'm put on YouTube. So I hope that we never see Jason's confession. The other thing that we have to know about Jason's case is that his judge is a recognized human rights violator. Judge Abul Ghassim Salavati has been sanctioned for human rights violations by the European Union. He was the judge of my case as well. And he sentenced me in absentia to 13 and a half years imprisonment. And if you wonder what was that half year about, it was for someone tagging a picture of former President Ahmadinejad kissing a boy on my Facebook page. I did not put that, page, put that picture on my Facebook page. Someone tagged it. So the judge deemed that by uh, having that picture, I meant that the president is a homosexual. Hence, I had to suffer six months imprisonment. And he also sentenced someone to execution because that person said that the myth of the Jonah and the whale is just a myth. It's not true. And he was killed, executed as a heretic. So uh, in my testimony this afternoon, I'm going to elaborate more on uh, these subjects. And I'll be happy to answer any of your questions about our campaigns to help Iranian journalists. We have a campaign called Education is Not a Crime, which is for the Baha'i minority. We have a campaign called Journalism is Not a Crime. Unfortunately, the Iranian government has been providing us with a lot of material. So we are doing a lot of is not a crime. The last one is being a dog is not a crime because of the way that they are killing the stray dogs in the streets of Iran and the parliamentary plan uh, by some members of the Iranian parliament to ban pet ownership in Iran. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yeah. Any good questions to either Dr. Shahid, Maziar, both, and we'll be happy to entertain any questions. Yeah, I have a question for both of you. Um, I mean, Professor Kotler talked about how the nuclear negotiations are overshadowing or maybe sanitizing Iran's human rights violations. I'm wondering what effect, if any, you think um, a deal or even negotiations towards a deal has had or might have on the human rights situation inside Iran. Go ahead. Okay. Um, it is difficult to directly correlate what's happened in Iran with any particular factor, but certainly many are concerned that, you know, a better sort of like image politically outside the country might give it license to behave differently at home. So that that is a concern uh, people have. At the same time, one must also recognize that should there be a raising, a lifting of sanctions on the country, there would be by itself positive developments in relation to the economic situation, possibly linked to that. But by and large, the concern one has is that by shifting focus away from the from the, uh, from the government's like bad behavior towards positive elements, then the uh, the issue of awareness of what's happening in the country on human, right, on human rights that becomes a concern. So one has to be very careful, you know, I think, and, and look at uh, what the government is doing. And one other element would be how the authorities in the country, how the Supreme Leader reads the, the final agreement that comes through. Is it a success or does it they want to paint President Rouhani as 
someone who's achieved a victory or does he do it differently? All of which could have implications for that. But by and large, the, the concern that I hear from Iranians is that because there is more focus on something other than human rights, human rights are getting neglected and therefore uh, government has more space, uh, as it were, uh, to behave uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very, very, if you like, you know, egregious uh, manner. Uh, we have to understand that the victims of human rights violations in Iran, they are not uh, only violated by certain diff uh, members of the security uh, uh, branches in Iran, but they're also the victims of infighting within groups within different groups. For example, the, I, I will talk about the Baha'is and the journalists. So the Baha'is and journalists, they are regularly uh, uh, brutalized by different parts of the Iranian government. But when there is an intense battle between different factions within the Iranian government, as we have witnessed since 2013 with the election of President Rouhani, their, the pressure on these groups intensifies because the conservatives who run uh, the courts and the security forces in Iran, they know that they can tarnish the image of the executive branch outside of Iran by public execution, by shutting down newspapers, by uh, incarcerating Baha'is, by killing the Baha'is. So as a result, I think the situation of the human rights in Iran has somehow worsened since the success, the, since the start of the successful negotiations. But I think we also have to be very careful not to mix these two things. I think they have to be two separate issues, the nuclear uh, negotiations and the human rights situation. Otherwise, uh, we're going to fall uh, into the trap made by the Iranian government that they want to have a, a major bargain that the West accepts uh, a nuclear deal and then as a result they think that they're going to treat Iran like China or North Korea that they're not going to talk about human rights abuses and human rights violations in Iran. Can you put any thought the argument that um a successful deal would empower uh, more comparatively moderate elements within Iran's power structure. Do you think there's any validity, validity to that? I think any opening in Iran, any kind of communications between ordinary Iranians and the rest of the world, Iran and the rest of the world uh, benefits moderate Iranians and ordinary Iranians. For example, if you think about the internet, uh, the, uh, the Great Wall, the, the, the firewall that, you know, this national internet that they want to create. They cannot really do it successfully if Iran has any kind of banking relations with the rest of the world. Like they cannot do it successfully in China, but they can do it successfully if Iran goes the way of North Korea and has no banking uh, relations with the rest of the world. So I think any kind of negotiations, any kind of deal, it will uh, help the uh, moderate Iranians. But at the same time, we have to be careful as human rights activists, as members of the press. We have to be careful that the Western governments, the certain officials within Western government, do not forget about human rights abuses because Iran is behaving uh, itself in terms of its nuclear program. Just to add to that, in terms of the space moderates have uh, to make an impact, that's being closed down very rapidly. Of course, one assume, if one assumes President Rouhani is a moderate, then one has to look at the power structure in the country where the government actually is in a very weak position. The parliament is very conservative and very powerful compared to the government. The judiciary is very, very conservative and all powerful. And therefore, there is not much even he could do if he wanted to even. And then we have new laws in place, the bills on uh, NGOs, the bills on uh, political parties, all of that will shut down the space, there will even at, which exists at present time, for moderates to make a difference should there be more you know, sort of easing of interaction between Iran and the rest of the world. But at the same time, I, I need to add that uh, the more embargo and more sanctions against Iran, more isolation of Iran is going to hurt even those uh, little activities that the moderates have at the moment.
question? Okay. I want to thank you all for coming. Our two witnesses will be appearing uh, before Foreign Affairs Subcommittee International Human Rights between 1 and 2 p.m., just upstairs in uh, room 237, I believe. And uh, those of you will have an opportunity, who can, uh, to hear further testimony. Again, thank you for coming and for being with us. And I want a special thanks and appreciation to both our witnesses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.